when rates go up, many of the times home prices come down. So if you have a home and you have uh, gotten rich on the equity that you've been really appreciating on since the beginning of COVID, you have an opportunity to refinance equity into cash, put into down payment with specific properties that could be your investment property or your next home, because lots of properties now are going anywhere between 50 to $100,000 plus below what they were six to 12 months ago. So as a potential investor, especially, you have a declining window. We've got all this equity, which will start to go more and more down as prices keep going down. So there's a window right now where you still have quite a bit of more equity than you had before the pandemic to take out and put into investment properties. This video, this webinar, uh, Alex and I are gonna talk about specific examples, numbers, enough for you to understand the bare bones of how this works. And of course, to get in touch if this sparks an idea to help you go on offense while everyone else is playing defense. Why is now the right time to use home equity to buy a home? Now, if you have a property and you have equity, this is the ideal time to consider using that equity to get an investment property. Before, you have less of that equity with potentially sliding home prices, which also falls in your favor around getting a home, perhaps at not too much of an inflated price. So there's a closing window around taking out equity before uh, it is gone or to a point where you can't take it out anymore. And there are some great deals to find in the market. So thank you for joining us and let's jump in. I'm with uh, Alex Dunbar. I'm Paul David Eskew from Level Up Mortgages. And we're excited to show you some math and some case studies around how you should look at the market right now. And please do not be intimidated. So the agenda, there's a market update on surging rates, but decreasing home prices. How does that offset? How do you cash out home equity? And then let's actually walk through some numbers on uh, a potential uh, buying of an investment condo or an upsize. And then we'll talk about where the market is now and how it's changing specifically with real estate. We'll do some quick reminders and introductions on who we are. And uh, of course, you guys can send us a Q&A at any moment and we're happy, happy to be in touch. So what did I talk about on CTV not too long ago? we have a raising rate environment now at the time of this recording it might be a lot more the point is uh variable rates have gone up at least 1.25 since the COVID dip and uh all you got to do is, is check the prime rate and you'll know that because of inflation there are also higher fixed rates now luckily as alex i think quickly put into the slide here alex why home price is cooling so basically, there's been massive increases over the past two years, specifically further out in the suburbs as we get out into Chilliwack, Abbotsford, and as we move our way back in, um, slightly less, slightly less, but almost 40 to 50% in some of these cities. Now, because of that, that's actually where we've seen the largest decreases in home prices, specifically in the detached and townhome market, probably a little closer to 15% detached, 10% in the townhomes. However, condos have still held pretty strong, as well as detached in Vancouver haven't budged too much or townhomes in Vancouver itself. As I mentioned, the shift has kind of come back into the Vancouver area. So as you see here, point three, condos are on sale. Vancouver downtown specifically has some fantastic opportunities right now, especially when we're looking at pre-sale units in Surrey for $1,200 a square foot, and you're able to buy uh, concrete build in Vancouver in good condition, rentable for under $1,000 a square foot in certain places, but we'll get to that later on. Um, however, there are some cities that are still pretty hot, such as the Tri Cities. But again, there is lots of opportunity out there if you know what you're looking for, but I, the markets are just drastically different um, kind of across the board. So it really depends on your unique situation. But there's plenty of opportunities out there for everyone. Thank you. Awesome. 
And so what we're seeing essentially why you might be able to find a deal on a home or why you will be able to find a deal on a home is there's been a major increase in inventory. We were at record low levels in December and slowly over time, we actually hit a peak in the market in February. And since then, inventory has significantly increased to a level that of course has brought the differences in supply and demand down, which has been a big reason for the decrease in prices along with the increase in interest rates. So as I mentioned before, the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver, which is essentially everything north of the Fraser River, has held a lot stronger. And the suburbs out in the Fraser Valley, again, the further out you go, the higher decreases we've seen, um, has presented some great opportunities from where they were just a few months ago. And as I mentioned, the suburbs, again, have pulled back about 10 to 15 percent, um, less so as we get to Vancouver. However, we do have some government intervention in coming. We're not exactly sure how all this is going to play out. So they are things that you need to be aware of. But number one, the cooling off period, which they've been talking about for a while now, what they've essentially stated is that it's going to be a three day period after you've got an accepted offer that you will be able to back out of the deal. There will be a financial penalty by the sounds of it, 0.1 to 0.5%. So I believe that would be about $1,000 to $5,000 on a million dollar home. How's that gonna play out? It's tough to say because what if you have a subject to financing? What if you have a subject to inspection and you back out for those reasons? So we still have to find out a little bit more once they implement it, but that could shake up the market a little bit because every time there is government intervention, unfortunately, it usually does the opposite of what they're trying to do. Um, and the whole point of that was to give buyers protection. However, we've already started to see the cooling off in the market. They haven't aimed it very well, but basically um, <laughs> we're not expecting it to do what they think it will. There could potentially be changes to down payment requirements. There's been talks for a long time now in order to try and reduce the price of homes that uh, down payments for investors could increase from 20% what it is right now, all the way up to 35%. Now, unfortunately, that's only going to hurt mom and pop investors or probably people like yourselves who aren't institutional investors and have deep pockets. Um, and we don't know if or when this is coming, but the only thing we can tell you is that investing in property is never going to be easier than it is right now, because all they can do is add policies. And lastly, they're potentially going to end blind bidding. Again, the funny thing about this is if you actually look at the data and research, as much as I believe they need to do something about increasing the level of transparency, the data actually shows that it's more than likely going to lead to increased prices rather than decreased prices. Of course, there are occasionally those one-off bids that are significantly higher than the asking price, but for the most part, through speaking with others, through my own experience and everything else, Typically, as long as you have a good realtor and you're doing your research, most of the bids are very, very close. And it's actually almost like a reverse psychology type thing in the sense that if you see a higher number on paper, you're more willing to actually beat that versus not knowing what it is and then picking a max. But anyways, those are just a couple of things that may be getting introduced into the market in the near future. We'll have to see, but stay tuned. So what is going on right now at the ground level? So just overall, there is less competition out there. There's less showings, less offers. We're not seeing the same strategies that were previously implemented again over the past 16, 18, 24 months where sellers were listing their homes a little bit low, holding off on offers and then generating a ton of bids, uh, specifically lots of subject free offers. So probably 90% or more of offers that we're seeing right now have subjects back in them, which allows you the ability to do your due diligence and not get caught up in a property that could have issues or that you can't get financing on because that's never a good situation. And especially as an investor, if you're trying to run the numbers, you're not going to want to just dive into a situation without having the time to do your due diligence. So as I mentioned, um, a lot more listings are actually coming to the market at the price they want rather than playing these games that they previously were. So you have to be ready to pounce. You have to have your pre-approval in place, your potentially your refinance in place, which we're going to touch on in a little bit here. Because when they hit the market, you can't be waiting until the weekend to get out there and look. You got to be in there day one. Otherwise, someone else is going to beat you to it. I, I'm consistently noticing this, that the people that are waiting until it's convenient for them, it's too late. 
I book showings during the week. Hopefully we want to get there th Wednesday or Thursday. Clients decide they don't want to go to the weekend and I have five or six showings cancel on Friday night or Saturday morning because they already have an accepted offer. Um, there is a bit of a tug of war right now between buyers and sellers. The sellers are starting to give in a little bit in the sense that sellers don't want to lower prices. Buyers don't want to meet the sellers where they're at. Um, but slowly over time, it seems that we are kind of finding that middle ground. So is now a good time to invest in real estate? Well, in my opinion, there's always opportunity out there. You just have to know what you're looking for, whether it's an up market, whether it's a down market, there's always opportunity. However, as we mentioned, we've just gone through this incredibly busy period of real estate with incredibly high prices, high demand, high competition. Um, but now that the inventory levels are way up, there's so much more to choose from. You can actually pick and choose versus having 30 people in a single property on one street because that's all that's available. So it's the less attractive properties that are sitting right now. The walk-in turnkey, beautiful homes that have unique features are the ones that are still getting a ton of attention and attraction. However, as an investor, this is your dream. You want to be buying properties that you can put sweat equity into, that you can add value to, right? You're not looking for the turnkey properties. You want to add value to those properties and figure out ways that because you actually make your money on the buy. So because you have more to choose from, you have more negotiation power, it's actually a perfect time to buy for investors. And again, you have your ability to do your due diligence. Subjects are back. You can get your inspection, right? You can make sure you can get your financing and get the rates that uh, you're looking for um, in the case that potentially you have to look between an A and a B lender. But that is uh, Paul's specialization. And rents are continuing to rise because there are different factors that they're bringing into the market with um, different taxes on empty homes and um, other things of that nature. There's actually less rentals and rent prices are going up as, and with the fact that there's just less people that can actually afford homes, right? They're trying to restrict the number of people who can purchase investment properties, which is actually hindering the rental market because just because prices come down a little bit doesn't mean that all these renters can actually purchase anything. So there's very low vacancies and very high demand in the rental market, which as an investor is good news for you. Cool, thanks, Alex. Um, so because of all of those facts, um, as an investor, where are you gonna get your down payment from? You may have it in savings, you may have partial parts of it, uh, but a lot of you will have to pull it out from equity, which is like this huge treasure chest of well, gold and unutilized cash. So let's talk about why it's very timely uh, to use that as down payment. So as I alluded to at the beginning of our talk, with these peak home prices, it means that you have more equity to tap into for down payment. Now this is diminishing because the market softens and there's less equity presumably for you to tap into, which might mean you have to look at other more expensive forms of credit and there's nothing as cheap as something that is secured against your property. Now, look, rates I know seem seem pretty high now, but they are still relatively low in the in the grand scheme of things. And um, it's a trade off with with where the rates are now. And in a year or two years from now, they might be even higher. So I think you can't really focus on the absolute, but it's the relative. But also, the, but the equity is the big thing. It's the, it's the closing window that you really want to make sure that, um, you know, is it going to be shut in your face? Now, let's take a step back. How does a refinance work? Well, the rule is you must always own 20% of your home. For example, if you have a million dollar home and you own 50% of it. So 500,000 is how much you owe or own rather and owe, I guess, because you're 50, 50. How much can you take out? The only rule is you must always own at least 20%. So it looks like you've got a 30% delta. So you can take out 30% from the 50 you own to the 20 you must have as your minimum. That means 300,000 more you can take out. What's the process? Pretty simple. Usually it's an appraisal and legal fees. Sometimes those are covered. It can happen within a month quite easily. 
and you will have to be requalified, which uh, for some people is a problem, for some it's not. That's where you talk to me and we, we strategize around what lender makes the most sense. But let's assume for this example that you're all good to go. And well, if you're not good to go, why may you not be good to go? Well, if you put down 10% on a property not long ago and you've paid off, I don't know, maybe a few years of mortgage payments and you're at 18%, you're still not at the minimum 20%. So you do have to have at least 20%. And as I alluded to as well, if you have too much debt or not enough income, you may not be able to qualify. And that's another bummer of where it might kind of, um, it might uh, stun you. So Josh, let's pretend like you're Josh. So he's a first time home seller. He wants an investment property uh, and he may not sell his home, right? He may sell, but he's more so a first time investor. So there's different ways to do this, right? We're gonna say uh, in example one, he wants to invest in property. Uh, he's waiting on a big raise at work. He's noticed his current place is valued $150,000 more than last year. And now he wants to afford a half million dollar condo with $100,000 down, which is 20%. What's he gonna do for that? Now, if his, if his current employment income isn't enough to, to qualify for the extra hundred thousand he may have to wait but we'll assume he's okay with that and how does it all work so we're looking we're gonna look at uh the opportunity of acting now and the cost of acting later in this example we're gonna look at him getting another investment condo for the same price so acting now what are the costs if you were to pull out a hundred thousand dollars okay two levers. You can lock in a rate as you take out the 100,000, right? Number one. And also on the new home, you can lock in a rate, of course, with where it's at right now, where the market is. Now, also, he has enough home equity to tap into now. That might change later. Here's an example. His current condo is worth half a million. The current mortgage is 300,000. So he owns 60% equity, right? Or rather 40% equity. Now, what is his ceiling? He can never own less than 20%. If he wants to pull out 100,000, that means his, ter his whole mortgage is 300,000 plus 100,000. He owes 400,000 on 500,000. So that's 80%. He's right at the limit. So this is, so if it goes down by a dollar, he's going to have to then borrow capital in more expensive ways. Right now, 3.5%, not bad, right? On a refinance. So that would eventually, so we're going to, we have an asterisk here and we're going to, so at the time of this recording, and maybe when you, of course, listen to it, rates go up and down. It's 3.5% on a 30 year amortization. So the refinance costs on that on 100,000 are $291 per month. So the current home, which has a $300,000 mortgage, if, he, if that is also at a 3.5, it's 1350 a month. And the new home is of course gonna have a $400,000 mortgage because he has 100,000 for the down payment. The rest is gonna be mortgage. $1,800 per month is what it equals on this rate in amortization, okay. Let's pretend you don't act on this. You wait a year, like, yeah, maybe I'll do it. Or maybe you wait a, a few months. Things can change very quickly. What's the cost of waiting? There's always a cost, rarely a benefit. If you time things, good for you. If you time the market, but very difficult. So um, what happened two years ago is kind of what would happen in a scenario like this, or even a year ago, right? Rates have gone up by a percent and you have less home equity remaining. So what's gonna happen to Josh? Well, his, his current condo, which was worth 500,000, went down by 50,000. The mortgage is around the same. And now the problem is that 80% of 450,000, or in other words, if he has to own at least 20% of now the 450, he cannot be in debt more than 360,000, right? He times this up here by 0 0.8, he's gonna get 360. So now he's, by the way, paying a percentage more on his mortgage than before, which means, of course, he's paying a little bit more per month, right, relatively speaking. And now the other 40,000 need, he needs for his down payment is on a line of credits, an unsecured line of credit, which is usually a lot more expensive. 
So if you add these two up here, the refinance and line of credit means he's paying $425 per month. And if you remember on the last slide, he would have been paying only $291 per month to take out this extra money for down payment. Now it's costing him $134 of extra cost to wait the, for one year based off the rate increase, less equity to go into a refinance uh, or a HELOC rather, and he's got to take on a more expensive capital. All said and done, he's paying $134 per month, over $1,200 a year, and for what? Right. So that's one minor but important cost to acknowledge. Now, this is where it becomes a bit more of a sting. It's with his current home mortgage. Usually you do a refinance and you, you may switch your mortgage. You go to another lender, you pull up the home equity and you get whatever the rate is at that point in time. So the payments were 1350. Now they're 1520 based off it being 4.5 now, right? So, and the new home he's buying, of course, that's gonna be um, $2,025 per month or 225 more than before, right? So, the total mortgage costs per month are going to be the incremental 170, the incremental 225, that's 395. So by waiting, suddenly he's paying 529 more per month on the refinance cost to pull out the equity for the investment property. And of course, he's paying more in his current mortgage. So that's kind of like, you know, the incremental cost of, of, of waiting on both of the properties. So that's a considerable amount. And that's where there's, again, a closing opportunity. Uh, another scenario would be is that because the home went down in value and, and therefore, you know, he had to take out more of unsecured line of credit, banks are less likely to give you unsecured credit than they are secured credit. You have to qualify to higher income. So he might not even be able to pull out enough equity to even make this work. So, you know, we're going broad strokes here, but there's other considerations as well beyond just the cost. Now, second scenario, something uh, Alex suggested during our brainstorms, but what if someone's upsizing? Hmm, what if you bring in your sister or a family member and you're like, you know what, let's say you're in a townhouse and you wanna go to a detached and you can actually qualify for that. Well, 20% of 1.4 million is, is 280,000 same principles as before now you have now you have a hundred thousand dollar townhome maybe that's again josh's sister who's now in the situation uh she has a 520 mortgage and she needs 280 refinance well isn't she lucky if you add these two numbers up that's eight hundred thousand. that's 80 percent of the current value so she just has enough to pull out that down payment for the next place that's the cost per month for pulling up that much at 3.5 uh, the current home, of course, um, is going to be two, three, three, five of, of mortgage payments, and um, which is this one over here. And then the new home, which of course is going to be a one point one two million dollar mortgage, which is the difference between its price and the down payment. That's how much you're paying per month, all on the same kind of example, right? So now, if you wait, how do these numbers change? Similar principles. With this dipping, let's say 200,000, which is possible, right? Around the same mortgage. Well, now she's really getting creative. It's only 120,000 you can take out of home equity and, and now 4.5, which is more expensive. You gotta go back to an unsecured line of credit, which is up quite a bit of money at 6%, 800. You add up the refinance costs and the line of credit costs and that's 1408, okay? And of course, if you go 1408 of the total refinance cost of waiting versus what it was before, would have just off of uh, a full refinance, it's about 150 bucks. So still, it's money you do, extra money you don't have to pay. Now, this is where it gets a little bit much bigger. Is it the current house that you could have got before at a lower rate? Well, look at this. You're paying $300 more per month, right? Uh, on, on that uh, on, on on the current townhouse and then on the new home well i mean that's a much bigger mortgage which means there's much bigger swings in incremental um expenses so total extra mortgage cost per month we're talking 300 plus 645 is 945 945 plus 151 the total extra cost of you waiting a year having to refinance more expensively 
and have a bigger, a more expensive mortgage on, on both your current and your new home, it's over a thousand bucks a month. Okay, so at this point, you're probably pretty clear on why waiting has its risks, right? Now, incrementally, well, what is the value of actually going through? Because it is work, right? And of course, look, we're going broad stroke. There are, of course, risks that are um, applied there, right? Everyone's different, but this is just to get your brain moving around. You know, uh, what we're waiting for a deal might be costly, okay? Now, take this with broad strokes. Number one, we're simplifying this. We're not including strata fees and property taxes, etc. So just, you know, uh, this is for illustrative purposes, but we're going to show you, um, you know, a lot of what, uh, what the ROI could be. Uh, and we're also, by the way, we're, um, and I'll get that in a moment around principal and interest. We're not drilling down too much. This is just for you to understand that if I go for option one as Josh and I buy the place at half a mil and I, I refinance properly, these are my mortgage payments, my refinance cost. I'm probably going to get a rental for about 1500 So, well, what does that mean, right? What does that mean if you do that? Well, it means that um, the incremental monthly cost is 591 because basically you are paying 1800 plus 291 is, you know, 2091. And then the rent is covering most of that. But if it doesn't, you're paying 591, which is not fun. But what are you paying that for? Well, your house is going to appreciate potentially at $80,000 in the next five years. That's on a conservative 3% annual appreciation. Now, my point around principal interest. Now, don't forget that um, as you pay down your mortgage, you're going to have a lot more, uh, a lot more principal paid off, right? That's the key. And specifically, actually, on the incremental monthly costs, Remember that you're paying off principal too. So if we split this up into actual interest and principal, interest being throwaway money, it's going to be a little bit less than this. But again, that's something for another day if you really want to dive in. But even if if if, if they were five ninety one of all interest, you you do the math on the monthly cost of this times sixty months, which is five years compared to the appreciation. There's money to be made, and it's the same example over here, right? In this example, um, you know the refinance cost and the monthly mortgage payments offset by all the rental income meaning remember you had a townhome before and that's rented out for three thousand dollars you also may have a basement in the new detached so it's twelve hundred so you're offsetting these two costs which are your mortgage payments and your refinance cost to take out of course the down payment for the detached it's offset uh quite a bit where now you're paying two thousand dollars per month remember most of that is going towards your equity right and if you look at the potential appreciation on that it is astronomically high so depending on which scenarios is most realistic for you uh and although it might be scary to do and seem like a lot of work and seem like you might want to just push it back and you know um see where things go later there's a cost to that and there's money on the table that you may be leaving so these are questions you want to ask yourself to then dive deeper with your local specialist Awesome. Thank you, Paul. A lot of information there, of course, but as this is a recording, you guys can rewind, take a look back at it. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer. But now we're going to move on to how you actually choose a good investment property. So number one is you have to determine your why, right? What are your goals? What's your time frame? How long are you going to hold on to it? What do you value more out of some of these out of this list? So convenience or ROI? You could have a solely ROI based property, but it might be out of reach. You may have to hire a property manager. You may not be comfortable with that. Everyone has a different level of comfort with these different things. Are you looking more into the future potential or the current potential? So are you looking into it for appreciation? Obviously, a little bit more risky or the current cash flow, safer but less potential in the future. And are you a high or a low risk person? And we'll touch on a couple of different or investments in a little bit here, but you really have to determine this because you could have the most perfect ROI based investment property. And if you can't sleep at night, how is that benefiting your life? Right? You need to find a balance somewhere in there. 
And then we have here some unconventional desires. We've actually been having a lot of conversations around some of this, what we'll call new age investing. And maybe you're very focused on some of these low emission, uh, zero net carbon, new homes that are coming out or uh, investing in different ways that maybe is helping the environment or other things, right? Like it's not solely just based on the amount of money that you're bringing in. There's more to it these days, especially, um, and again, that just comes down to your why at the end of the day. Well said. So here's a couple of types of investments. These are just the general ones. Of course, there's some variation in between, but long-term rental, this is your most common type that the majority of people, it's a buy and hold, and you're just going to rent it out over a long period of time. Typically, we would say it's um, you rent it out a, a year at a time or a longer, at least minimum of one month. So it's lower risk. It's a long-term play it is probably gonna give you a lower return, but you're also having lower turnover. So you're always having tenants in there. It's safer and there's still a great potential, of course, dependent on your market for appreciation and other things. Now we have flipping, which is a moderate to high risk. The reason being, let's say you just purchased a property recently, all of a sudden the market comes down. Do you have the funds and the means to hold on to this? Did you buy at the wrong time? Did your numbers work out, right? If you're going to do something like this and you time it wrong or there's some hidden costs, you're stuck with that property. And now how can you move on to the next one, right? The money is going to be tied up. So this is something that without experience can be very difficult. It might be something that you want to get into with a partner. If you want to go this direction, there are very high potential for returns, especially if you make the money on the purchase, which I always talk about because you want to buy something that you can add value to, right? But this is a shorter term play typically. Now, moving on, we have short-term rental, or you may think of it as an Airbnb. And this is typically when you're renting out a property um, over and over again for less than a 30-day period. So higher risk because you don't have the tenant in there at all times. You have more risk for vacancies, especially if it's in a seasonal area. For instance, the Soyuz, it's a summer town. It's more difficult to rent out a property there in the wintertime. You're probably going to have to lower your rents. So the majority of that money is typically made in a single season. Again, very, very high potential for return, but there's also a lot of risk there as well. So if you're not familiar with it or you don't know what you're doing, um, not the safest play necessarily. Um, and you have higher turnover, as I said, you're just having to consistently get clients in there, get uh, new customers in there, which with Airbnb and things of that nature, as you may know, you have to build up uh, a good, re good reviews and um, client base and referrals and everything else. And lastly, we have pre-sales. So this is an interesting one. There's always opportunities out there. However, there's a lot more risks than most people like to think. Um, so I put it at a, at a moderate risk because you can do your due diligence on it. And it really depends on what your goals are before going into it. Um, you're pretty much betting on future appreciation potential because for the most part, you're buying it at a future price. They're priced higher than resale, but you might not actually be completing on it for three, four, five years. So you're hypothesizing that it's going to actually be at a higher dollar value when you actually complete on that, when you actually get your mortgage on it, um, if that's what you choose to do, unless you're going to assign the unit. However, there's a lot more things that the government has implemented lately, um, and you have to be very careful, for instance, because if you don't lock in your mortgage prior to, let's say in an interest rate environment such as we're in right now, and all of a sudden interest rates go up, maybe the pre-sale doesn't actually appraise for the same value as you went to purchase it at. Now all of a sudden you're stuck and you can't actually complete on it. So you're either gonna take a loss or, well, you're gonna take a loss one way or the other if you're not able to actually go through with that. So again, that could be a whole other presentation, but just something to consider. Uh, one of the benefits, of course, no mortgage until completion, but it's also a detriment as well. Um, and lower upfront costs because you can lock in this property at a future value while only putting down a deposit anywhere between five and 20%. For the most part right now, what I've been seeing is around 15, but as the market kind of cools off, I think developers are going to offer more incentives, lower deposit structures. So there could be some potential deals out there in the near future. Um, so now some buying tips. One of the things you want to actually look for is as they say in real estate, location, location, location. So one of the worst properties in the best neighborhoods, of course, this comes down to, um, it has to be the worst to an extent, right? You're looking for something 
Again, I'll repeat it over and over again that you can add value to. And if there's already homes around it that are selling for higher price points, but have similar features, this is gonna bring up its value, especially after you've done these renovations. So that's why I say consider ARV. ARV is after repair value, which is a calculation that we can always help walk you through. And you're pretty much just taking the price you paid and then how much it's gonna to cost to do these renovations and looking at what the future value is. Um, as I said, money's made in the sweat equity and renovations. And there's a lower buyer pool for these types of properties because they're not turnkey and a lot of people don't want to do the work. And that's where the opportunity lies for you. Now, future potential, what are things you should look for? Future transit, right? There is the SkyTrain that's going to be heading from Surrey to Langley from King George Station to around 203rd and Fraser Highway in Langley. Scheduled to be around 2028, who knows? Um, but things like this is what can help increase values if they're bringing more transit or um, future development as well, right? If, if they are kind of gentrifying specific areas or if you see developers buying up lots of land, typically you wanna follow the money because those are people that are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into these projects. And most of the time, they're gonna have a pretty good handle on the market and what's going on. And they usually have some sort of inside sources, whether it's the city or somewhere else. So it's always a good idea to at least pay attention to that. And that's why I say follow the money. And then rezoning and subdividing potential. If you're buying a lot or a tear down house, look into the future potential. Maybe you can tear it down and build a duplex or a, a larger home, or maybe it's future potential for a land assembly where it's going to be multiple homes in the same neighborhood and you can actually get a higher sale price because of the fact that another developer is going to come along and want all the land so you don't want to sell the homes individually for, let's say, 1.2. Maybe they're willing to pay you 1.4 or 1.6 if you all sell them together. Again, that, that's a whole nother presentation. But um, in a detached house, you want to look for other things to add value. Can you add a suite? Maybe it's a partially finished basement. If you can add a suite into that, you, you may be adding $100,000, dollars $200,000 to the property, as well as the fact now you have another source of income to offset mortgage costs, to potentially... Um, allow you to purchase another property down the road. So always looking for ways to add value. Now, another one that not many people think about, but it's considering the types of tenants based on the location. So if you purchase something near a university, you're probably looking for university students, but you also have to keep in mind that's going to be higher turnover. It shouldn't be difficult to fill those vacancies, but are those the type of tenants you want? Um, just things to consider. Or additionally, if you're purchasing in a smaller town that doesn't have many industries, if that industry gets shut down, right, uh, are you diversified enough? Is there enough other um, work there to actually bring in tenants for you that will be working in those different industries, right? Um, we've seen this happen before in smaller towns when maybe the coal mine gets shut down and all of a sudden it's a ghost town. So just things to think about. It may look really good off the bat, but just have to always consider uh, diversifying even in the types of tenants. Um, or maybe you're just in a, uh, an area with, you know, um, white collar versus blue collar or whatever that may be. Now, I will kick it off to Paul for the recap, but uh, hopefully you guys have enjoyed the presentation so far. Indeed. Thanks, Alex. So yes, lots of things to digest. I mean, let's boil it down to three really simple points. There are some good deals to find in this market. And we walked, talked about the how and the why to refinance, to tap into what is a decreasing home equity, which works against you and means you have to maybe borrow more expensive capital. And because of the increasing mortgage rates, as you do that, that new place, hopefully you get at a, at a good deal, it's going to have a higher mortgage rate. So it's kind of this like closing window where some things offset. But as you saw through the illustrations, uh especially because of the increasing uh rates and uh less home equity that means you have to have different credits with higher rates <laughs> so um if you're ready now is a time to at least completely consider what that looks like action steps to start investing are the things that alex walked you through and cautioned you on uh to wrap up uh i am paul and uh uh, as, a, as a mortgage broker, I mean, we really work a lot with people that um, work in the technology industry, have commission or 
restricted stock unit income. Lenders get weird about that. Uh, people that are entrepreneurial as well, who are not in tech, real estate investors, a lot of newcomers are always entrepreneurial. And even just first time buyers who just you know want to have a very transparent process and understand the natural bias of going to one lender versus 50 others, which of course we, we broker and have pretty strong relationships with, which means lower rates and faster approval periods. A uh, bit of my background, grew up in Mexico, speak Spanish, uh, done all kinds of cool stuff uh, around travel and studied at UBC and um, I, everyone I connect with, I always uh, I see as a long-term 30-year uh, relationships. Of course, that's how long a mortgage can be, right? So uh, we want to have fun too while we're doing this process. And what people tell me I do differently is just who I focus with. Uh, entrepreneurs, investors, uh, we get really uh, detailed around special tools and financial modeling. And it's about helping you decide what are the trade-offs and what should I choose based off my trajectory and where how I want to invest. I mean, not, a lot of people don't think of themselves as an entrepreneur, but really you are. When you get a house, you have an asset. You are an entrepreneur, which is super cool. Uh, and yes, you also need lenders who can understand your entrepreneurial ways or help you deal with, you know, uh variable income different side jobs things that is money in the bank but sometimes the bank doesn't acknowledge it which is very annoying and uh, yeah, we're lucky enough to have god in a broker of the year nomination and we're on google and all that fun stuff so happy to connect with you at your convenience uh, i appreciate your attention and run the numbers that's what it's all about and you gotta think about that long-term uh profitability both financial and mental, because it can be very stressful. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Uh, looks like my little slogan isn't up there, but all I wanted to say is it's redefining the standard of your real estate experience. Now, unfortunately, if you haven't been through a real estate experience before, uh, unfortunately, you don't actually know what you could potentially be missing out on or what level of service could be provided. And that's why I want to provide that right from the start. Um, basically, you don't know what you don't know. So who do I work with? Love to work with first-time buyers and first-time investors or seasoned investors, either way. But I just love educating uh, as well as helping out-of-town buyers and working with referrals. Uh, quick background on me. I was actually born in Burnaby, but grew up in Surrey, the dreaded Surrey. Although, unfortunately, a lot of people don't know there's actually a lot of great parts of Surrey. And usually they base the whole city off of a uh, few small communities that aren't my favorite as well. So um, I actually have a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology previous to get in, into real estate, which has kind of uh, given me that analytical, critical thinking um, approach to essentially real estate itself, especially investing, right? Very numbers focused. Um, I do a lot of educational content, so content creator. Love to do lots of videos um, similar to what you're watching right now, because I feel like that's the greatest way to reach the broadest audience and continue to educate and empower people. And I'm part of the Dunbar Real Estate Group with Remax Treeland. Um, and so what makes me different? I choose to empower home buyers by focusing on education and building relationships with them to make sure that they're well-informed and feel confident about their buying decision. So I'm not here to force you to do anything or tell you to do anything. I'm here to educate and consult and provide you with opinions. But at the end of the day, you're the boss, you're the one that has to pull the trigger and you're the one that has to live with, I guess, the consequences or the benefits of whatever decision that may be. I just wanna be here to hear you out and try and guide you in the right direction. But I don't like pushy sales and that's why I take this approach. Um, so I love to help people build wealth through real estate. I believe that I take an innovative approach, as I mentioned, using video, social media, uh, things like this presentation right here, right, to reach people like yourselves that I wouldn't otherwise be able to. Uh, I have a great network of professionals across the nation, so if you're looking to invest elsewhere or look at other opportunities, I am more than happy to connect you with someone within my network. And again, as I mentioned, I'm detail-oriented, I'm analytical, and I have a growth mindset. I'm just always looking to continue to learn because you can never know enough, but just want to leave you with a couple of closing thoughts. As we've kind of mentioned, there is this window of opportunity right now. And as much as you can't time the market, this is about as close as you're going to get. We are pretty confident that things are essentially leveling out or slightly going to decrease in the near future. And by taking this opportunity now, it may give you that ability to 
take out that equity and actually purchase something at a slightly lower price or just have more options to do so. And again, taking that longer term mindset, even if you are to buy something and it goes down another 5%, if you're holding on to that for a long period of time, this has happened so many times in the past, you're going to be significantly, significantly up money as long as you're willing to hold on to that asset for, you know, three, four, five plus years. Hopefully you just don't ever sell it. And that's why we're trying to teach you these strategies to hold on to the properties you already have in order to leverage them and purchase another one. So I don't want to give too many predictions here, but I think you've got maybe a six month time horizon before these opportunities start to fade away. Um, could be shorter, who really knows, but I believe that it's always best to act quicker rather than waiting around to see what happens. But with that, I will hand it over to Paul. Sure. Well said. I mean, I would just want to congratulate you for taking the time to be curious and uh, into your research. Uh, you have blind spots. Everyone has blind spots and this should have uncovered a couple of them, but it should also give you some sparks to actually light up those blind spots into real clear data. And really what's the action step is of course, get in touch with us and start to run some numbers and get out there, get out there, look at properties, and um, yeah, enjoy the process. So thank you for your attention. And uh, we will surely be in touch. And until the next time. Thanks so much, guys. And one more closing point that Paul didn't actually mention, but another massive reason to get in touch with a mortgage broker over a bank is that they're typically going to be able to actually use more of your rental income as qualification, which could help you buy a better property um, or use that for something else. So again, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to use a mortgage broker, but thank you so much guys for tuning in. And if you have any questions or contact information is on the screen now, and we look forward to chatting with you. Thanks a lot, Alex. Take care, everyone. Cheers.